Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to today our webinar on how to apply for a PPP loan. My name is Vic Farley and I work for the City of San Jose's Office of Economic Development and I'm delighted to have with me on our panel Annie Lopez and Anne Height from the Small Business Development Centre here in Silicon Valley. What we're going to do over the course of the next hour is to give you a presentation about 20 to 30 minutes that takes you through some of the most important elements of how to apply for a PPP loan. And then we're going to have a Q&A session and we'd be delighted for you, anyone who's attending today to use the chat box and put their questions and we will work our way through it as we have done on previous webinars. Um, I'm going to be using a PowerPoint presentation and there'll be a lot of information in that PowerPoint. But the good news here is that a copy of the slide deck, all the links and a recording of this webinar will be made available to everyone who's registered to attend. And we hope to be able to send that out to you by email within the next 48 hours. So you don't need to take any notes unless you choose to because all of this information will be made available to you. So I'm going to put a, a PowerPoint on the screen now, and we will begin our presentation, and I will invite Anne and Ali from the Small Business Development Centre to be able to uh, give their introduction in one moment. And let me just get the PowerPoint on the screen, and let's... I do apologize, it's a bit slow today. Um, we will get this as soon as we can. Okay, now we should have that on screen. Does everyone see that? That's perfect. Okay, so thank you, Anne. Here we are. Uh, let's go through the slide deck and please feel free to put in your questions on the Q&A and we'll do our best as we're going through it to respond to all of your questions. So this is the quick agenda, what we're gonna go through. Quick summary in a moment, an introduction from Anne and, and Ali from SBDC. We'll give you the one page of quick tips on how to apply what you need to do now. We'll quickly introduce, introduce the key terms of the loan and what, what it means to be eligible for a loan. And then we'll dive into the detail. We'll look at gross receipts, what's included, what's excluded. We'll look at the importance of payroll and how payroll drives the loan calculation. That's very important. We'll sum it all up and then we'll move into the Q&A. Okay. Anne and Ali, take it away, please. Sure. So this is Ali Lopez. I'm the program director for the Silicon Valley SBDC. Um, I oversee about 20 plus advisors who are specialists in different aspects of business. Uh, one of the key um, uh, services that we provide is free one-on-one -on -one advising, as well as free and low-cost workshops like the one we're doing now, which we partner with several of our community partners. Um, go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> I forgot I didn't have control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does SBDC do exactly? We provide access to information and resources to help you sustain and grow your business. So whatever stage your business is in, even if it's in the pre-venture stage, we can assist you. We can assist with access to capital. Uh, whether you want to go get any of the COVID-19 funding or traditional funding, we're here to help you. Next. Uh, like I said, uh, one of our fundamental services is access to capital. We work with many banks, credit unions, alternative lenders like CDFIs, uh, which is like Lendistry.com, who is uh, reopening their California relief grant next week, which is February 2nd for the second round. Um, we can assist you 
on any type of loan packaging, whether it's a 7A, a 504 loan, um, any of the grants or uh, like the economic injury disaster loan, which is the EIDL, as I mentioned, the California Relief Grant, the PPP, um, as well as the PPP forgiveness. Next. So if you are not an SBDC um, client, I strongly suggest that you go to our website. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, just sign up, it's easy. Just click on apply now and then um, we go from there and you could either ask, if you would like to work with Anne, who's gonna speak in a few minutes, then you could just put her name on there as the referral, uh, her expertise, and she'll explain that in more detail it is in finance. So uh, take it away, Anne. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne Height and I, uh, I'm an advisor with the SBDC. I come with uh, 30 plus years of financial services industry experience and a passion for helping small businesses. Um, I have been partnering with the SBDC, um, with the city of San Jose and um, the California, um, the governor's office to do the California relief grant. And now uh, we're working on PPP, which opened up last week. And so we're here to help you address any issues and questions you may have. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Let's let's get straight into the presentation. Um, my my uh, my advice to everyone who's participating in today's webinar is: if you need advice, please contact SBDC. It's a great way to get answers to your questions. Um, so here we are. Uh, PPP is now live, and lenders are accepting applications. What that means for you is don't wait. It's a first come first serve program. So as soon as the money runs out at a federal level, the program ends. But there is a calendar date within which no more applications will be accepted. And that's the end of March, March 31st, 2021. So effectively it's just over two months is the window to get your application in. But I advise, and I'm sure Anne and Ali would, would, would say the same as well, don't wait, we need to get on with it. Now, if a business did not receive a PPP loan in 2020 last year, then potentially you can apply, you can apply, my apologies, you can apply for two loans. It's known as a first and a second draw. Um, but there's limited time here. And we've already had a good question from Anne on this point in, in, in the Q&A in the chat. And essentially, you would have to get your first draw application uh, submitted and approved within an eight week window of the March 31st end date. So effectively, you've got to get that application in within the next week and then use it over the next eight weeks and get a second application in. So the chances are quite slim, but it is in theory possible. And it's something where you've got to sit down very carefully with your finance person internally or an advisor who's a tax preparer or a CPA, or go directly to SBDC with Anne and, and Ali and talk that through very carefully, because you don't want to get to a situation where you've, you've missed out on an opportunity to apply because you're trying to grab both, both loans at the same time. I think there's a bit of technique here that could secure you definitely one loan, and if you're clever, possibly two, but you have to weigh that up very carefully indeed. Anne, would you have any thoughts on that point? Actually, with time being of the essence and the uniqueness of um, this little window, because I don't think they anticipated the window, um, you really need to be uh, well prepared. Yep. And uh, I don't know that it's going to be prudent to try to do one versus the other. I think what you need to do is have a strategic approach to what your goals are over the next year and focus it on that aspect of it. My sense of this, I, I, it's a great question that Anne has given us that I think that I'd wanna go and check the rules carefully because I think you've probably got about a window of about a week to get this done if you wanna first draw a loan and then give yourself the opportunity of a second draw a loan by the end of March. We'll come back to that when we get to the q and I think um, the thing here is that the deal would need to be approved and mm. funded and the chances that your lender will 
accommodate you in such a short window may be a tough one. And the other part of that is you need the eight weeks to define the forgivable period. Correct. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to that at the end. Let's zip through. Okay. Quick tips that follow on. Most lenders, in fact, will be applying for a second draw loan. If you're going to change your lender, then please look online at who's out there. And you can, there's an SBA online search tool called Lender Match. Check it out. It's good, it's, just, it's good basic research to see what's there. And if you need a quick solution, often it's a fintech lender. And there are a number of fintech lenders that are available to businesses here in San Jose. I keep a list of them because they're public and it's public knowledge. And if anyone wants a list of the fintech lenders, I can provide that to them through the Q&A. A second draw application, you must find your original PPP application number, your first draw, because that is a required piece of information. And it should be on, a, on, your, on an email or a document record that you would have received in the last 12 months when you received your PPP loan. Uh, you will need your 2019 tax return or most recent because without providing that, the lender actually won't transfer the monies into your account. It's a required compliance check. Um, and if you're not familiar with your financial records, your profit and loss statements by quarter for 2019 and 2020, see your tax preparer or CPA now. And often there are software issues like that QuickBooks provide with a solution where you can standardize a, a, a report on QuickBooks to create quarterly P&Ls for you that show the revenue loss that we'll talk about when we compare the two calendar years. But you will need that uh, particularly if you're going to go for a loan, a PPP loan over $150,000, because that will be needed at the point of the application. Key terms of the loan, not really changed much from last year. Maximum loan value, $2 million, no collateral or guarantees. And the loan is based on your payroll, two and a half times the monthly payroll, or three and a half times if you're an accommodation of food services business like a restaurant. Up to 100% of the loan can be forgiven if it's used for approved purposes, a minimum 60% on the payroll. Whatever's left that isn't forgiven becomes a loan with an interest rate that's fixed at 1%. You could think of it as a great way to have a fixed rate 1% loan that you couldn't get on the open market. Nonetheless, the loan maturity is five years and all loans will be processed by all lenders and that it is the responsibility of the borrower to provide the information. So a second draw, what's changed? These are the key points here. Um, must have been in business and active before February the 15th, 2020. And I had some great questions last week about changes of ownership. Someone bought a business in March, 2020 that existed for many years before, what do we do? And again, you've got to go and see a, 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 a CPA or, or a tax attorney there to check that regulation, but very important around date. Um, your first draw PPP loan must be fine. There's no audit or, or SBA inquiry that would hold you up. So check the status of your PPP loan from last year if you're any, in any doubt. But the two key things that will drive the eligibility is you must have no more than 300 employees, and you have to demonstrate this 25% reduction in gross receipts between comparable quarters in 2019 and 2020. And what the federal government is really saying is the impact of COVID last year in 2020 would have meant that you lost income. And so long as you lost a minimum of 25% of that income in any one quarter compared to 2019, you're eligible to apply. And that's what we're going to talk about in more detail in a moment. So the calculating, calculation of the reduction is based on your figures that you have presented either through your tax return for 2019. You may be preparing it now for 2020, but certainly your own financial reports using software like QuickBook, QuickBooks or other, other means of, of, of reporting on your profit and loss statement, whether that's by spreadsheet. Um, but it's very important that you have a clear record for both years, 2020 and 2019. And it's about comparing what's termed in the regulations, the gross receipts, all the income that came in that you show in your business, whether you're self-employed, an LLC, an S-Corp or a C-Corp, you're all treated equally able to apply with the same eligibility criteria. So the gross receipts is a very important term here. 
So when do you need to provide the documentation to substantiate the reduction in gross receipts? As I've mentioned, below $150,000, the PPP loan means that, that you as the borrower will need to provide that documentation, not at the point you apply, but when you want to calculate the loan forgiveness, i.e. you've had the money, you've spent the money, and you're now going to fill in the form to convert that loan and decide how much of it has been forgiven, hopefully all of it, the 100%, and whatever's left turns into that five-year 1% loan. However, if your loan value is greater than $150,000, you have to provide the documentation substantiating the reduction in gross receipts with the application form. And that's normally known as SBA form 2483 or the lender's equivalent form. But what I'm stressing here is the, the lender, the bank is not able to process your application without that documentation. If the loan is above $150,000, you'll get stuck. It won't go through. So it's very important that you address the question of gross receipts now and talk to a tax preparer, CPA, or, or go to the SBDC to get some assistance if any of this is unclear. And a number of people who are self-employed, there's some in really interesting kind of ways to look at this. But fundamentally, if you're self-employed, you're going to be looking at your bank statements as evidence, and you're going to be looking at what is counted towards your business activity as a self-employed person um, to derive the income. And the, the kind of the authenticity of these numbers, if you're in any doubt, is your tax return, your IRS tax return. So these are the, the evidence sources. I've just quoted this and taken this from the SBA US Treasury regulation so that you can see this. Uh, your quarterly financial statements are fine, uh, but you're going to have to confirm as the applicant the accuracy of those. Your bank statements are good, uh, a very good way to evidence the, the change in the uh, income, your gross receipts between the two years, and of course, the IRS tax filings. And of course, 2020, very few businesses have, of course, submitted their return, let alone had it approved. So you're in that process at the moment of gathering the information. But it's very important uh, if, for instance, you've got a good piece of software like QuickBooks, use that to create the reports for 2020. So that's the documentation you can use to suit your business. Um, let's go into this. So what's included in gross receipts? Again, the, the language and the terminology and the words used, very important. For a for-profit business, gross receipts generally are all revenue in whatever form received or accrued in accordance with the business's accounting method. And as you know, for those of you with a good interest in finance, there's two ways to record uh, money in your bank account for the purpose of your business. It's either an accrual or it's cash. So you have to be clear about ensuring that you're consistent in the way in which you present that financial information. You'll include the sales of products and services. You'll include the income that you source from interest and dividends, um, royalties, fees, and commissions. That's the important point. You're capturing all the gross receipts. And if you're concerned about any of the words, always check the definitions used and report it on your IRS tax reform tax returns. Those are the crucial documents in justifying what you're going to do. What's excluded? Now, many of you may not feel this is relevant to you, but for some businesses, of course, those there are exclusions. And again, check with your tax preparer if, if any of this is, if you're unsure about this, but certainly proceeds from transactions between domestic and foreign affiliates is something that affects a number of San Jose businesses because a number of businesses here have sister companies abroad in other countries where there is trading between those two companies. So check that point out if you need to as well. So you've, you've looked at gross receipts. You've, you've seen that the comparison between the one quarter and you're only choosing one quarter um, in 2020, you're choosing the quarter where you had the biggest revenue drop, the biggest drop in your gross receipts compared to 2019. So if you pick quarter one, which is January to the end of March in 2020, you're also then looking at the same quarter in 2019. 
January to the end of March, and you're comparing the two figures. Someone asked me last week, well, I lost only 20% overall in 2020 compared to 2019. Does that mean I'm eligible? And the answer is probably yes, because it's the quarter, not the annual that the SBA and the lender is interested in. So think of it in terms of the quarter. You may have had a terrible quarter, but overall the year, you didn't go over the 25%, then that's okay. For some businesses where you, you are relying on income that comes in in just one month, as opposed to a steady income over 12 months, then that makes it much more straightforward for you in terms of being able to meet that 25% threshold. But many businesses in 2020 had a kind of open and closed phenomenon. They were open mainly till mid-March, closed, opened partially mid-June, and then restricted closures in October. So it's been a very up and down year in terms of how individual businesses and the industry you're in has been affected. So some businesses have been completely unaffected. Their, their income in 2020 was comparable to 2019. They were not subject to closures. But for other businesses, particularly, say, restaurants, nail salons, many of the, the high street shopping uh, retail areas have been deeply affected by the impact of COVID. So it depends what your business is and how it's been affected will determine that eligibility. So moving on, let's, let's look at how do we know what value of loan that the payroll protection program will generate for my business. And essentially what we have to do here is we have to look at the aggregate payroll costs. And you're using data either from the previous 12 months or from the calendar year 2019. So you've got to look at kind of you've got to look at your, your, your financial statements for your business and say, hey, I'm going to either look at these previous 12 months or I'm going to look at calendar year. Whichever is the higher figure is the one you use. You want the highest payroll cost because that's the figure that will drive the loan. We won't get into seasonal businesses here, but you can see certainly in agriculture and farming, seasonal business has a huge influence on, on the payroll. And certainly some businesses that are, for instance, attached to a particular holiday season events, similarly that use staff and employees on a, on a, on a kind of almost like an on-off basis, you've got to look at that very carefully within, within the time periods that are set out here. And also if your business was, was um, not in, in existence um, prior to February 15th, 2019, you've got to look at averages as well. So really um, it, it, it kind of behooves you to have a really good look at your financial statements for both 2019 and 2020 as it affects your payroll. What can be included in the payroll calculation? Important consideration. So it's not just the salary or the wage, commission or other forms of similar compensation. And it includes tips, for instance, if it's a restaurant, those that are recorded obviously within your accounts. It also you account for vacation, dismissal costs. The group health benefits is, could be substantial for you and state and local payroll tax purposes. So those are the key elements that you check through in your profit and loss statements, your financial statements for your business, whether you're self-employed, a sole proprietor, uh, or you're an incorporated, corp an incorporated body like an S Corp and a C Corp. It's those components of individual items of expenditure listed here that are included in your payroll calculation. And it could be you just create a, a short spreadsheet on your Excel and that will set it out very easily for you. Or again, you can, you can create a report on QuickBooks or other forms of, of, of software, or indeed a number of businesses, it came up in our, in our webinar last week. In fact, they outsource all their payroll costs to another company, a payroll specialist company, and that payroll company has produced reports because they know so many businesses who are their clients need this level of information in order to make their application. So if you're using an outsourced payroll provider, please contact them now. Uh, please check with them that they're able to supply this information because you're likely to get a very quick, fast, efficient and accurate service that way. Okay, key numbers. I think anyone who's familiar with PPP will know this. There's a, there's a ceiling on the amount that a person can be counted here 
for the purpose of the of the payroll, and that's a hundred thousand dollars. So if if you've got an employee that's that's for instance receiving a a, a salary of one hundred and ten thousand dollars over the course of a year, you can only count one hundred thousand dollars. So you've got your profit and loss statement, and you then got to check it to make sure that the employees within it. Uh, if anyone is going over $100,000 individually, they have to be capped at the $100,000. Now, if you want the kind of numbers as, as a kind of rule of thumb here, $100,000 is the equivalent of $1,923 per week. And two and a half months of payroll, which is the crucial bit of calculation, is the equivalent to 20.833% of the annual payroll. And a business with an annual payroll that is greater than $10 million is likely to secure the maximum PPP loan of $2 million. If you're a restaurant and you're on three and a half months of payroll, that's the equivalent of 29.166% of the annual payroll. And the $2 million loan is generated on just $6.8 million. So you can see that there's quite a difference between the two and a half times payroll and the three and a half times payroll. So here's a simple guide that, that we've created that kind of gives you a, a way of looking, okay, my annual payroll on the left-hand column, let's take one as an example, is $250,000. What does that mean in terms of a maximum PPP loan? Well, it's $50,000. You can just get a sense here to give you a rough idea uh, based on the annual payroll column, where on the, on the left-hand side, comparing it to the right-hand side, what the PPP loan amount is. So that's the two and a half times the month. And this is the one for restaurants and accommodation and food services. Um, what you can see here is that if, for instance, you have a payroll of 171,000, then your PPP loan is $50,000. If you double that to $342,000 a year, then your PPP loan is $100,000. That gives you the scale of, of the importance here of knowing that the payroll calculation is the key driver for your loan. We'll come back to that and we'll look at this in more detail with the Q&A, but I wanted to give you a sense of what's a quick way to be able to get a, a calculation uh, before you get into the detail of looking at your financial statements and checking everything as to what you consider to be the, the kind of dollar number attached to your PPP loan. So let's just sum it up and then I'll invite Anne and Ali just to cover any points that I, that I, that I missed or, or points really to, to build on and then we'll, we'll try and get into the Q&A. So here's the summary. Check in with your lender now and make a commitment to apply soon because we don't know how long there will be sufficient funds in the program at a national level. Also, if you had a PPP loan last year, make sure there's nothing outstanding in terms of compliance, paperwork, or, an, or if there is an SBA audit that requires you to complete any forms because this may slow you down in your second, uh, second draw application. And we ha I've had examples of emails in the course of the last week asking me questions directly on this. And if there's any uncertainty about, for instance, the, 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 the use of the loan or an SBA audit, you must go back to the lender and you must check with the lender what the status of that PPP loan was if you have any doubt in your mind that there may be an issue or a problem. Locate your 2019 and 2020 profit and loss quarterly financial statements now because you will need to submit them if your loan is likely to be over $150,000. Talk to your tax preparer and, and of course the SBDC if you need advice before you submit your application. Use the matrix that we've presented in this slide deck to give you a sense of loan value as an estimate. Apply through your lender and follow up if necessary to check on the status of the application. Don't just assume, oh, it's been, it's, I've completed it and sent to them. Check to know that the lender has, has accepted this. And locate your 2019 IRS tax return in any event because the lender will not be able to transfer funds into your account if they haven't seen that tax return. Ideally plan ahead. 
have a forecast of your P&L for 2021, so you can see what eight or 24 week period within that you should choose, because you'll be thinking ahead about the loan forgiveness component. And last but not least, someone like me who, who works in public service, I keep all my records, so you should too here. You should keep a record of all receipts and payments to secure with the 60% on the payroll to get that 100% loan forgiveness and keep your bank statements as a record for four years for compliance purposes in case you're unlucky enough to, be, to have a random SBA audit. That's the key summary here for you. Anne, Ali, what do you think I've missed? What should we, what should we just quickly check over before we get into the q and I think you did a fantastic job, Nick. Um, you hit the numbers and you hit them hard. And, um, <laughs> I think just now double check the Q&A to see which ones are driving at the numbers. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. I think, I think what I wanted to convey without being too heavy about it is a business owner should have an instinct for the numbers and you should have um, a way of being able to source your documents that you need, whether it's from your accounting software, your tax preparer, uh, or to come and see you and uh, SBDC to check that you've got the right thing. I, I'm very nervous about uh, applying. I, I always want to do my homework before I apply for something. And I, I try and encourage businesses to think that way with this as well, because businesses, business owners are under pressure at the moment. We, all, we, we can all see that. So um, I tried to put the matrix on there and to give people just a sense of what the loan value could be. Because often people are applying and it's almost a surprise at the end of the application as to what the loan value is. Yes, right. And a lot of people um, apply and um, not sure how much they want to use. A good strategy, again, is to know what your goals and objectives for your business are. Yep. Yes, I know it's a changing landscape. You know, uh, you turn and something else changes. But you kind of have to have an idea what you want to do for your business. And that way you can start to gauge the eight to 24 week period, how you need to structure it so that you, for sure, you can hit your uh, loan forgiveness timing correctly. Yeah, that's a really good point now because when we ran this, the, the webinar last week on PPP, uh, the governor hadn't made all the changes on COVID. So many businesses of course, last week were closed. This week, of course, businesses are reacting and reopening. So you would have a completely different view, wouldn't you? You could argue last week would have been a very negative view. Now this week, it could be a, a more cautiously optimistic view based on what type of business you are and where you are. Okay. So you're, it's a very important point, Anne, isn't it? To sort of think ahead a bit and have your game plan and your strategy for what you're gonna do with the money. Yeah, very important. And be um, ready for anything because we could easily slip back into the old tier. Yes, yes. Shut down, no payroll again. And yes. So it's just like Anne says, just be mindful of, and be honest about your your business, you know, and if you know it. And then you could all, you know, a lot of questions are asking about sole proprietors, independent contractors, uh, companies that don't have employees. Mm -hmm. You are yourself is also an employee, so you can include whatever salary for yourself in there. So, yes, I think the point you make about difference, different things may go better, things may go worse. We, we 2021 could be quite unpredictable. So, yeah. in financial terms, I've my advice to two or three businesses I was talking to last Friday was have a contingency, yes. whether that's a financial contingency or a planning contingency. Mm -hmm. That, 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 and many businesses are under too much pressure in some respects to think in that in those terms. But for those of you who can, I do encourage the business owner to, to almost have plan A and plan B. Yeah. Yes, and those are things that you could talk to with the business advisor. Yes. Good point. Yeah. 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 And certainly a number of people in retail and, and restaurants, if you look at how they've survived the last nine months it's because they've been able to generate more sales online right they've been able to promote something in ways that they weren't previously doing because they didn't have to to be honest the business attracted people to that location right so early on yes. when this was happening in the beginning and we you know sbdc advisors were telling businesses whether they were restaurants or retail 
they had to have an online presence, they had to have social media, and those that were resistant, obviously, uh, were left behind, and it made it a lot harder for them to recover from and pivot whatever is going on. So yeah. it is, I think, even after COVID, it is always important to have different avenues in order yeah. to promote your business. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, should we go into the, the Q&A? We've got some good, quite detailed questions here that, that I'm extremely nervous about because <laughs> 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 they're good questions. So let's, let's look, let's start with the beginning. Uh, Laurie, I've read a couple of places requiring that require applying for the second round to be done with a different email than the original. So how will they know the first one went through or not? Is this a scam asking for a separate address? I would be pretty nervous and that that could well be a scam. Any thoughts there, Anne, Ali? Um, I tend to agree. I haven't heard any of our lenders that we've worked with asking for a different email particularly if, uh, for instance, Lendistry, if you went through them the first time, they're going to want to know the history. So they're going to, you have to use that same um, email address when you upload your second draw, because they're going to do a comparative for your first draw. So um, I don't know if it's a scam per se, but I haven't heard that there has to be a separate email address. And it seems pretty unreasonable for them to request that you use a separate email. Um, you know, they don't, um, institutions typically don't dictate like that to um, their clients that you do that. I think the panel are saying to you, Laurie, we're deeply cautious and skeptical about why someone would need a different email address. If you had the opportunity, try and contact them and speak to someone directly. Yeah, and then if you're not sure which lender to go through, go to SBA Lender Match, and those people are certified to work with these type of loans. So th those would not be a scam. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, an anonymous question. If the applicant is 100% owner of, of a single member LLC with no employees and has a 25% decrease in revenue between Q1 and subsequent quarters, what is the maximum amount eligible to the owner under PPP2? Well, um, if, you, if, you, if you've had a 25% plus decrease in any one quarter between the two years, then that just means you're eligible to apply. It doesn't tell you how much your loan amount is going to be. Is that the right answer there, Anne? I'm kind of thinking about this, but the, the revenue question is really about eligibility to apply and the Correct. loan value is really the, the, the size of your payroll. Correct. Correct. And they still will take into account your debt service, right, And Because they still want to, it, worst case scenario, if you, it is not forgiven, they don't want to burden you with additional um, payments to a loan that you won't be able to service. So they're going to look at all of that. Uh, it's not just the decrease. They're also going to see, they're going to look at the patterns of, how are you going to generate income and pay this loan back if it doesn't receive uh, forgiveness? Correct. And, and the tax returns and the information from your income statement that they're collecting does um, tell a story. So right. um, be mindful of that as well. But in, in essence here, if for instance, you've got a business that has very uneven gross receipts quarter to quarter, you could have a dollar in quarter one and let's just make a number up, a million dollars in quarter two, and then you're back to one dollar in quarter three. Um, it's very obvious if you're looking at the 25% loss, it, you're looking at the quarter difference between the years. So uh, that you, you've just got to see in front of you almost the eight quarters, haven't you? you got, uh, typically, that's the thing you want to look at because you want to identify what caused either that anomaly, if it's an anomaly, or that trigger that event that made you have a spike. And if you can easily address it, then it makes all the difference in what you present to um, the SBA. Yep. Or to the lender. The lender, yep. Um, well, the person, the person who was anonymous, if they've got a follow-up question, please put it in the chat and we'll come on to that. Kathy has asked us, what is the covered period? Can it be retroactive to the period prior to funding? Um, my answer to that would be no. What do you think, Anne and Ali? 
Um, um. <laughs> it, I read this summary and I believe it's a, the covered period is not going to be retroactive. It has to be mm. for the um, eight to 24 weeks that right after your funding. Correct. So let's play that out as an example. I apply, I'm successful, and I get my loan, hits my bank account on, let's call it March the 1st of this year. Mm -hmm. It's not retroactive, so I've got to look forward from March the 1st. Right. And I'm, and I'm going to choose a period which is a minimum of eight weeks, but I could go up to 24 weeks. Yes. So if I've got a projection, a forecast for 2021, that may assist me in thinking through the length of period that I'm going to take. Yes. <laughs> Is that helpful, Kathy? Please come back to us with another question if that's helpful. But I think the key point in, your, in what you're asking is there's no retroactive period under consideration. It's all about looking forward. What if we were operational in 2019, but had payroll only from January 2020? Oh, that's a good question. It's a startup business in 2019. So you would have um, the four quarters for uh, 2020 to work with. Yeah. So how would you meet the 25% debate if, if you try to compare 2020 to a business that didn't have a p l for 2019. That I was thinking about thinking that I, I'd again have to look at the regulations very carefully because I think there is something in the regulations on this point about, about businesses that don't have financial statements for 2019. So uh, uh, Ram, Ram, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to you, I think we don't have an answer for you that we can give you this moment but I will attach, when you get the slide deck in two days within it, there'll be a copy of the financial regulations. And I will, if you want to email me, and I'll give my email address at the end of the presentation, or, or Anne or Ali, we'll see if we can answer that point, because it's a good point. Um, Ernesto has asked a different question. Is the PPP loan similar to the SBA loan? And I think with SBA, you mean IDL, E-I-D-L, I would assume, or any of the other 7A or 504 loan-based products. Um, my answer to that is no, but <laughs> Anne and Ali, what do you think? Well, I agree, um, no. PPP and IDL were um, designed this year, uh, last year specifically for this pandemic. The SBA has different um, disaster relief programs that it has utilized over time and this is one of them um it's just a time a, a, a temporary uh loan program yep. to cover COVID. very good i think the key difference between ppp and any other sba loan program is that ppp is the only forgivable loan correct if you have to take a loan pro product that is backed by the sba you can have you can have interest deferred but you have to pay 100% of the loan back over whatever term you've agreed. But with PPP, potentially, if you use it well, and a minimum of 60% of that PPP loan is committed to payroll, payroll. then it is 100% forgivable. Correct. Oh, good question from Kathy. Can you include workers' comp insurance in payroll? Do part-time employees count in the payroll calculation and for loan forgiveness payroll spending? Hmm. And Ali, what do you think? There's almost three questions in one there. There's the workers' <laughs> comp question, there's the part-time employee question, and then there's loan forgiveness. So can yeah. I answer the easy one? Yeah, oh, yeah. The part you covered <laughs> in your presentation. Go right yeah. So part-time employees do count in your payroll is the easy yeah. one. You did cover the workers' comp in um, the payroll section with, with what's included, and it included right. the insurance benefits, um, so forth. Now, if you're a construction business, for instance, your workers' comp is a very significant item of expenditure. Uh, when I was supporting a construction business a few months ago, and we were talking about where are the major costs, I hadn't realized how significant the workers' comp figure could be. Kind of again, um, I, f I feel I'm repeating myself, but 
a, a, if, you, you, if you're a business owner, you do need to have a look at your financial statements and see what's in it and how it's kind of labeled within the, within the statement. So, so if you want to pull out workers' comp, it's a good question to ask your tax preparer or, or yourself and at SBDC, uh, these individual elements that just might all be included or put somewhere else in the financial statements. Um, the last component of the question, in loan forgiveness payroll spending, I suppose the obvious point, Ali and Anne, is that that's the most important reason for having the PPP loan, is that you are going to commit at least that 60% of the loan value to the payroll. And having the documentation to support your spending. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of businesses, of course, like um, us as individual, um, uh, uh, have bank accounts online and we do all our financial transactions online. And often it's a very good way to keep your evidence and your documents or download them into a folder on your laptop or your computer. So you've got it all nicely set out for you for 2019 and 2020. Yeah. And um, then um, <clears throat> for this PPP, a uh, little bit different from last year, you can include uh, other operational expenses like accounting. You can include HR. You can include right. um, PPP equipment. Uh, things like those are forgivable. So that part of that 40% um, yeah. that you're spending, those are additional um, costs, operational costs that you can uh, get forgiven for. So that's a little yeah. bit different from the previous PPP. So reading between the lines here, what, what, what the federal government is trying to do with PPP now is make it easier to get all of that 100% forgiven. Because you yes. have more things you can count but so long as you get to that 60% payroll number, and that's the message I've had to keep giving all week. People said, oh, can I include this? Can I include that cost, my rent, my debts, et cetera? Long list of things. And I said, of course you can. So long as 60% is spent on the payroll, you'll have 100% forgiven. <laughs> um, documentation, documentation, documentation. Keep very good. Documents. Very good. Um, okay. Let's move another anonymous question. The SBA website says you can compare 2020 quarter one to subsequent quarters. Um, I think what that means here is that you're gonna look at all your four quarters in 2020 and look at all four quarters in 2019. And you're gonna pick the quarter, whether it's, so if we take quarter one in 2020, that doesn't stop you from looking at quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, and choosing the one that obviously shows the 25% reduction when you look at 2019 for the same quarter. Is that, is that the right way to explain that? And Ali, have I conf do you think I may have confused someone here? No, that's correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, well, it's an anonymous question. So if, if there's anything here that you want to come back to us on and be more specific from, from the point of view of the person asking the question, please do so. So uh, SBA says in verbatim, must document 25% reduction in gross revenue on an annual basis or in any one of the four quarters in 2020 as compared to 2019, which is exactly what Victor said. Thank but you. Yeah. He wants to take 2020 first quarter and then choose the um, second, third, or fourth, whichever complements it. And that it has to be quarter to quarter comparison. Yep. And so you're kind of taking that 2020 quarter and then looking back into the previous year. You're not looking yes. forward. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm a previous owner and I did have a PPP loan and forgiveness. A new owner of the ex same existing business now after October 2020, uh, am I applying for the second draw only or do I have to have the previous owner's first draw loan? Oh, I haven't had that question before. That's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. And the answer is yes. Okay. Because the business is what continues. It doesn't matter who owns it. They're gonna look at historical data. And so you're gonna have to have the previous taxes for that business because that's where you're going to do the comparison. If you don't, that's where you're going to have the difficulty <clears throat> of showing um, that 25% reduction. 
So the easy way to do that is, of course, the previous owner <coughs> supplied <coughs> as part of the due diligence when you when you purchase the business. Correct. A set of the financial statements for 2019. Mm hmm. That, that a CPA or, or, or an advisor or indeed you at SPDC could look at and break that out into the four quarters. And uh, just know that the lender uh, will let the previous owner know if they are selling their business, they're going to look into that if they have a PPP loan because yep. per, part of the due diligence is, is the new owner going to take any of whatever debt they have onto uh, their new business, which is an existing business, but um, with a new owner, are you gonna take over some of those debt, correct, Anne? Correct. So, yeah. so essentially, it's a, the business is a going concern. It changed ownership, but the financial records for 2019 should be made available to compare right. now to the new owner who, mm -hmm. who's been happily or successfully running that business since the day they purchased it or acquired it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the previous owner has to let the lender know, yep. uh, especially if they have a PPP, because that goes into the part of the contract. Um, I believe the question did say uh, the loan's been forgiven, but even so the new owner needs the numbers from the business its history in order right. to get a new PPP. Correct. As a cautious person, I, I, when I in a when I used to own a business and I made an acquisition as part of the documentation of the acquisition, yes, I required certain pieces of information to be made available to me. So I think loans, debts, um, any doc, there should be documentation around that because that affects your ability to to own and manage the business that you're buying or purchasing or have been given. So if you're the current owner please check. And it's always easier if you're on good terms with the previous owner. That's, that's kind of the human side to this story. Um, okay, different question here. I'm a hairstylist renting a station in a beauty shop. No employees. <clears throat> so effectively, this, this, this hairstylist is self-employed. I have rent expenses, but I stopped working in March. 2020 and I'm planning on not going back to work because I've lost all my clients due to shelter in place. Do I qualify for PPP? My answer to that, uh, just to sort of set this up for Anne and Ali is to say that the spirit behind PPP is you are a going concern and you are intent on having received a loan to continue the business that you are currently uh, owning in whatever legal structure that is, whether you're self-employed, sole proprietor or C Corp, L Corp, or sorry, S Corp or, or LLC. So I, my sense of this is you probably don't qualify, but Anne and Ali, what do you think? Um, <laughs> is the essence behind the PPP because it's paying forward payroll, it's not paying backwards payroll. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you have in essence closed since March and um, have no intentions of reopening, then um, I would not recommend getting a PPP because you wouldn't meet the forgiveness guidelines. Yeah, for the forgiveness, you have to show that you continued with your employees and your payroll. I, I don't know this person's circumstances, but when I've spoken again to business owners who are facing very, very severe cash flow financial problems, I've said it's often better to seek advice now than allow that problem to, to get bigger. So um, go and talk to SBDC or one of our other business owner space partners if you need confidential uh, information or advice, or you just want to talk to someone about your circumstances that you find very difficult to talk about publicly or, or even with family members, it can be a very difficult, tough environment to want to share this level of information. So um, uh, it could be there's a different type of, of response here than, than just saying yes or no to you. I think on balance we're saying, we don't think you qualify for a PPP, but you, but you should think about the future and take advice. Um, Laurie's asked a question, can I include my 1099 employees in the payroll calculation? 1099s are not employees? No, no. And, it, and they're gonna look at how your um, payroll is structured utilizing your tax return. If they're not included in there as an employee, 
then you cannot. And they can, as a 1099, apply for PPP for themselves. So they don't want you to double dip. Okay. So you can't really, in a sense, um, push up your loan value by including 1099 employees into the payroll. Correct. Okay. Uh, Laurie, that may be disappointing news for you. I'm sorry, but that's kind of how the regulations are drawn. Um, you can't include 1099 employees. Um, We've got an anonymous question. No payroll is one for the owner, only a drawer of profits. So that feels to me like a self-employed person who's only taking money once they've, they've earned money through contracts or services, and that then shows in their financial statements. Correct. They can apply as a sole prop or independent contractor or whatever, however they're set up. What so we to do is ensure that however they pay themselves or compensate themselves, that's the documentation they need to hang on to. So yeah. if it's once a month, once a year, once a quarter, show the documentation. Again, so an extreme case could be they only, they only drew money from their, their work and services in one day, one year. They kind of, they, they may have drawn $150,000 in October and drew nothing in the preceding 10 months or the month after. So in effect, it's just $150,000 were their drawings. But of course, there's a ceiling of 100,000. So all they can count is the 100,000. So that's the, what you have to be aware of. You're counting all your- You have to show that documentation that it was 150, yep. and however, and then- So it's good to have your bank statements, isn't it? Which show the money coming in or the money going out. And it's good to, to have your financial records, whether it's a profit and loss statement or a financial statement from a tax preparer that, that, that is consistent with financial, everything joins together. So for 2019, your, your bank statement, um, your, your profit and loss and your IRS tax return should all have kind of consistent numbers to them. That right. would be the thing. It's going to show us officers' compensation on the tax return, anyways. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of that would be the gold standard, isn't it? That all three pieces of information line up exactly. It's okay. not always like that. <laughs> it, we all know that, um, <laughs> in truth, because a tax return is serving the purpose of paying the minimum amount of tax, not demonstrating the maximum amount of profit. Correct. And they're going to look at your payroll records from your third party if yes. hopefully you have a third party that could provide you all of this if not they'll look at your payroll records to compare uh with your tax return i mean they're going to look at everything <laughs> yeah okay let's move on uh and esto's asked can i apply for a ppp loan if i already have an sba loan yes yes um it's been pretty clear in the u.s treasury and sba documentation that that uh, you can. And um, is there an issue here with taxable income? I can't, I was just trying to think about that when I was reading the question. Um, my memory of, of the new PPP regulation is that the, the PPP loan is not ta treated as taxable income. Is that right? Or have I, have, I mis have I misread that, do you think? Actually, that's something that's being debated. Um, ah, okay. I'm reading an article, and if I can. Um, share with you just a little bit on what it says. Uh, are you asking if the, the uh, business tax deductions are allowed for the tax return? Is that what the question was? No, I, um, I was kind of taking the question on a bit more than was intended, I think, to be honest with you. I was trying to think out loud here. If, if, you've, if you, you get a PPP loan as well as an SBA loan, um, uh, either or both then treated as taxable income when you, when you have to do your 2021, file your 2021 tax return. That's, and I wasn't quite sure. I did, and as you said, there's a debate going on and I wasn't sure what the answer was there. Um, uh, and a lot of CPAs and um, the uh, um, accountant, um, Gap uh, generally counted. Yep. Standard. Gap, they, standard gap standard. Yeah, they are actually um, lobbying. Um, Congress is actually lobbying to to uh, make it um, deductible. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We'll come back to that point. Okay. 
Uh, Natina's asked, um, in our first loan, we used monthly data and only got 10% of what we could have gotten. Is there any way to ask for more in for the first uh, application? We will apply for the second. Um, my, my instinct to reading your question, Natina, is no. If you've signed the document, received the loan, that's it. They can't go back and, and kind of say, oh, we made a mistake here. Correct. And that's why we're emphasizing the importance of having accurate records from the beginning and to make sure that whatever you're inputting, that's the amount that is accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. got, oh, we've got a great question. A little, bit, a little bit on the SBA loan. Uh, there's also the debt relief program that they're extending. So um, for existing SBA 7A 504, yep. And micro loans, they will at least an additional three months if you've already had debt relief, they will add an additional three months for the, to pay for the principal and interest uh, starting in February 2021. And then, um, but they will only cap it up to $9,000, which is different from the previous debt relief. Yeah, 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 very good point. Let's move on. So we've got an anonymous question here that says, interesting one about, this is about loan forgiveness. What is the max that they can be counted for payment to an employee who makes over $100,000? The covered period would not be a full year, so will forgiveness only count that employee who is not over 100000 in the covered period? So in effect, if the covered, let's say it, the covered period is just eight weeks, and the person's on $150,000 a year salary, can they only count $100,000 equivalents over that eight week period or not? But I think it's an interesting question. It's, it's the 100,000 over the eight week period. Yeah. Yeah. So effectively that's the $1,923 a week times by eight is the equivalent of what you can commit to loan forgiveness on the payroll. And then the non-payroll can be up to 40%. So 40% of, of the 1923 in effect equals the 100%. Yeah, okay. Um, so to answer this question directly, you will only be able to use the 100K ceiling. That is the limit to which you can use for loan forgiveness purposes. Yeah, okay. What does a self-employed, let's move on. Vanessa has asked, what does a self-employed business with no employee need to provide to get loan forgiveness? Oh, good question. It's the same thing. All, all the um, information that you use to pay yourself as the self-employed or um, sole proprietor. Yep. Um, so whether it's, you know, your draws, or if you're making regular paychecks to yourself, that's the documentation you need to provide. I, I think, and um, what's what's interesting here is, I mean, um, I think we should run a webinar on loan forgiveness soon. Yeah, <laughs> I think that would be that would be a good one to get get into the sort of nuance in the weeds uh, of what 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 you the, the do's and don'ts of loan forgiveness. So that's a good. Maybe we'll come back to that in the next week or two and think about. That because of the, we've had a new a new document issued by the SBA to simplify loan right. forgiveness. So, all, all forty two pages. Yeah, all forty two pages of simplification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Amir has asked, "Do you have to apply for the second PPP loan through the same lender as the first? No. No. It's a market, and you're the customer, and you get to choose. The, the subtlety here is that not every lender is taking on new customers for PPP loan purposes. So you need to do your research and discover which lender would make a, uh, an app, would accept an application from you in these circumstances. I know there are a number of online fintech uh, financial institutions that are approved by government that would do that. So I think the key point here is research. What do you think, Anne and Ellie? Absolutely. Um, there, <laughs> okay. Again, quite a few of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the links um, at the end of your summary here um, of your presentation um, takes you to where you can find that lender match uh, to yep. 
you know, right. your due diligence. I think the main thing in SBA um, emphasizes it, make sure that whoever you go through, they're not charging you for their services. Yes, absolutely. Really important point. And I had some, and an email today actually, and I was very worried about it because I thought someone was trying to charge a business owner to just make the application. Yeah, no, yes. it should all be free. Yes. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, we had $20,000 in PPP1, used 15,000 for owner's compensation. Do I need to return the remainder 5K before drawing PPP loan two? My answer to that is no, you, you don't return anything. The 5K effectively is converted into the, the loan that you repay at a 1% fixed interest rate over the next five year period. Mm -hmm. um, and that that paperwork should be cleared with the lender before you submit your second loan. Correct. So, so there is no reason why the lender cannot process your application for the second PPP efficiently and on time. Right. Not unless there's a loan reviewing process. Oh, what, what's that, Anne? Um, so if the SBA is reviewing documents and they submit a request to the lender to get documents from the borrower, right. clarify some points. So it's like an audit. Yeah. The SBA's, yes. Okay. So, and I've had a question of audit this week from a business owner who was worried. They thought they'd done something wrong. And I said, no. There's a sort of almost like a percentage kind of audit question going through various uh, financial institutions that have done a lot of loan applications. It's not a comment about you as an individual business owner. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. What um, uh, Natina's asked, ah, the first draw funding most likely isn't there, at least from the government end. Will the lender have some left? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> uh, if, if you haven't applied for a first draw loan, there is money there now for you to make that application. Yes. Yes. If you've made that application last year, can you go back and make another one or change it? No. no. Oh, no. Uh, you make a second one. You, make, you go straight on to the second one. Whatever, whether, whether you were happy or unhappy about last year's first draw PPP loan, you can't go back and and make any changes to that, you're stuck. You just have to look forward now to, to the second draw loan and get it done quickly. Anonymous question, shouldn't you choose 24 weeks over eight as that would make sure you have enough time to use up all the funds? That's a very logical question. And if your business, I guess, is one where you've got a very steady rate of income and expenditure, then you should go for the 24 week period. If, it, if it's a very lumpy one, uh, you'd probably go for a shorter one. Would that would that be the right strategy, Anne, or would you do something different there? Well, it's understanding the numbers of your business, um, yep. what's driving it, and that would help you make a solid decision. Uh, yeah, I I agree. And and if that if your numbers are broadly consistent, then you've got a better chance of getting 100% forgivable yeah. if you go longer rather than shorter. Right. If, you, if you've got very up and down income, then look carefully about where that, where that income is because you want to maximize, and sorry, the income and the expenditure, you want to, it's the expenditure that counts it. You want to maximize the, the forgivable component of the PPP loan. So logically, the question would suggest go longer than shorter, but it depends on how you attribute your costs and your expenditure. Right, because if you're paying your employees weekly, you can extend to 24 weeks, right? Yep. So you can only go for up to eight weeks, um, utilizing as much of the funding for payroll as much as possible. So sometimes the eight week is better for those that are gonna utilize it within that covered period. And then uh, hoping that the forgiveness window is available, they wanna just get it done. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, very good. <laughs> Natina's asked, can you elaborate on forgiveness, loan forgiveness? I want to use this example. If the revenue is 100,000, I could get a 20,000 loan. Uh, let's take that revenue being payroll revenue over the two and a half months. But it's not clear on what the requirement is for forgiveness, as in brackets, the 60% payroll part. So my way of looking at that is if let's take the $20,000 is your PPP loan, you've got to use a minimum of 60% of that $20,000 that's $12,000 uh, 
for payroll purposes over the forgivable period, whether that's the eight weeks or the 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. The remaining 40% for mortgage interest, rent, yep. utilities, and you can get it forgiven, providing you maintain your employee levels um, as well. So I think the answer to Tina is, yeah, if it's 20K in loan and 60% that equals 12,000, then work out the, the, the period of weeks from eight to 24 that would account for the $12,000 and then add in the other $8,000 of non-payroll costs as Anne has just highlighted. And then I have a lot of clients that want to make it easier on themselves and they chose to use their PPP 100% for payroll only. And that's also, you can also do it in that sense. If you're, if you know you're going to have that 20K within that 24 cover period and you can cover payroll only, you, that's makes it much easier, yeah. but it's up to you. <laughs> Again, my, my, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but if you've got any doubts about the information we've provided, do, do seek out Anne and Ali at SBDC and talk to one of their advisors on a one-to-one -one basis to get into the, the weeds and the detail of, of your particular business circumstances. Uh, Anne has followed up with a question as a non-profit. Um, uh, Chase Bank have asked for the 9141 form, the W-2s and the 990 part four for our non-profit. Do we also need to submit the 2019-20 tax form or does the W-2 cover that? Um, my reaction to that is that um, None of the 2020 stuff is required just yet because we're, we're not even out of the month of January. So those forms are not even generated. Ah, okay. So if it's the tax returns. So the 2019 tax return is a yes, isn't it? Because yes. you need to prove that as a compliance check mm -hmm. to the lender for them to be able to then transfer the funds into your account. Yes. And you may need it uh, for the purposes of working out the calculation of what the, the payroll value would be that becomes the loan value, but you don't need to submit it other than for that purpose. No, unless it's over 150,000. Of course. But that then takes you into the, the yes, oh, of course. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if that's not clear to you, please follow up and we'll come back to you. Jeff asks, how does one compute the loan amount for a sole proprietor with zero employees? I think we covered this, but and that and that's down to the income you receive for the services you provide, as shown in your bank statement over the course of of twenty twenty compared to the quarters of twenty nineteen. And that's your monthly average times two point five. <laughs> yes, exactly. So monthly average times two point five over the calendar year of twenty nineteen or twenty twenty. You pick the year, don't you? Yes. Okay, Natine asks, what's the deadline for forgiveness for the first loan? And also, can we locate an email or receipt for that loan? Or will the lender have that data? I'm pretty confident the lender will have that data, but it's obviously easier if you've kept that receipt in the form of an email. If you haven't, then go to the lender. And what's, I d is there a deadline for forgiveness for the first loan? I haven't seen a specific no, date, you. but I may have missed that. It's a good question. I think originally it was a year from when you for right. got your loan. It was a year, uh, but now they keep extending it because they keep revising uh, what's the maximum forgiveness and the easier form. So right now we're still waiting on the new 150K or less forgivable new form. So uh, lenders are, are revising um, how they're receiving the forgiveness from their clients who decide, oh, I got only 100K, so there's this new form that I could use. So um, right. that keeps getting extended. So at this point, we don't know when it's going to end. <laughs> well, the SBA hasn't set the deadline yet, but the rule of thumb is that you have 10 months after the end of the covered period before you would be required to start making any monthly payments. Right. Yeah. So. It's within that period that you would seek the forgiveness. Yep, got it. I, I think it reinforces the point that maybe we should provide a webinar just on loan forgiveness. <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, Amanda asks, um, if we did not get a first round PPP, but we got a disaster loan, which 
with the EIDL. Is it okay that we apply for the second draw of a PPP loan? The answer to that is yes, you can apply for a PPP loan. It, it, but you would, you would get a first round PPP. Yep, it would if you, still be considered the first draw because you did not Good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. get the first round PPP. So you need to quickly check if, if I were you, Amanda, I would quickly look at the, the regulations for a first draw PPP and talk to the lender that you're intending to make an application with just to make sure that they are accepting a first loan PPP and if they have any particular requirements so, so you, you understand what's needed. And again, come back to SBDC if there's something in there that you're not familiar with or not comfortable with. Yeah, because for the second draw, there's additional criteria that yeah. uh, don't apply to the first draw. So that's why there's a little bit of a difference. I mean, the, there's an advantage and disadvantage as far as I can see between first and second draw. The advantage of the first draw is you can be a bigger organization. You can be up to 500 employees and apply, whereas it's 300 with the second draw. And with the first draw, you don't have to show a revenue loss on, the, on comparing the two years of 2020 to 2019. Well, obviously you're going to have to show some sort of loss, but it's yeah. not required. The 25% is not required on the yeah. first draw. Yeah. So that's kind of, you have to just, again, look at the nuance of the difference between the two regulations. At the back end of the slide deck, as, as Anne was saying, we've got all the references and the links to the documents. So if you like to read this thing, uh, you can see it all. But if you just want to talk to an advisor, then again, uh, talk to, talk to, um, my partners here at the SBDC and, and they've got the expertise to, to be able to work on that. Um, Anne has asked, for a non-profit, does the percentage of ownership question matter at all? Should I just say 100%? Well, they're a non-profit, aren't they? It's not like a for-profit business. I've, I, don't, I don't know enough about non-profits. Um, well, you're going to have to show your articles of incorporation and then you're going to have to show your um, who the authorized signers are. So it's not a matter of ownership, yeah. but who is authorized to take on this type of loan. And that's usually, hopefully, if you did your nonprofit correctly, <laughs> it does yeah. state who on the board is allowed to do these type of transactions. Yes. When I've worked with a nonprofit, it's often been, I, when I've had to, on behalf of the city, and there's a contract, it's often been whatever's in the Articles of Association of, of the Nonprofit. Right. Uh, and it would specify who is a signatory, like the president or the right. chair of the board or the CEO may have a delegated authority up to a certain level. Right. But it should be spelt out in, in a legal document that defines the, the Articles of Association there, Anne. Um, right. And you're quite right. I, I, you probably, if you have to put a number, it, it's it's a hundred percent. But I don't think you have to do that. And and I apologise, I'm not an expert in nonprofits. Right. Um, and if you want to come back to me, Anne, on that, I will find try and find someone who has more in depth knowledge of, of the nonprofit world for you. Victor uh, Score has a great nonprofit. Um, they do, don't they? Yeah. So Score yeah. would be really good to work with them on the nonprofit since SBDC does not. So, and if you want SCORE's contact information, uh, leave, leave, leave something in the chat box uh, or send me an email and I will come back to you with a, with a, re a referral to SCORE. Uh, Laurie's asked, my question is similar to what you're answering now. This is around 1099 workers. I've now converted them to employees. Ah, okay. So my payroll is much higher. And can I include my 1099 workers in the calculation? <laughs> wow. If okay, I like that, Laurie. If they're considered employees now, okay. Okay. and you have, you can, you're still doing a comparison from previous year. So you're going to look at previous year. How, how did that do? Uh, how, where is the reduction if this is a second draw? Um, so they're going to look at, oh, previous year, you didn't have employees. So it, again, knowing your entity from 2019 to 2020, it, you can include them now, but you can't include them that last year. So I know that might be con uh, confusing, but the numbers are what's going to drive it. So you have to look at your tax returns and your P&Ls. So just thinking out loud, obviously I'd be fascinated to know more about this business. Uh, Laurie, it, it, it's kind of a scenario where you've actually got, in terms of a PL now, a much bigger expenditure 
yeah. or yes. staffing because you're showing what were previously the 10 to 1099 workers who effectively were subcontractors or consultants but right. self-employed or they had a contractual service relationship with you as on the payroll so your costs are much higher from, a, right, from an accounting you're required to do benefits workers comp and all these other insurances that you didn't have to carry in the previous year yep so interesting it, it sounds like possibly like a con uh, construction company maybe. <laughs> uh, well laurie i think i think um rather than give you misadvice I, I i would sense that this is a really interesting uh business that you should talk to an expert on a one-to-one -one basis with and go through this in some fine detail just yeah. to reassure yourself that you and Anne likes these challenges um <laughs> So I think I think Laurie, uh, yes, Anne is here, um, uh, and there's a there's a right way of doing this. And, and if you contact SBDC, I think Laurie that that um, it could well be that Anne is the person to whom you may then subsequently meet to go through this. But uh, it's a very really interesting one. I like I like accounting and aud auditing questions um, because I think you get to the truth of a business, how well it's doing, or the pressures of that business are reflected in the balance sheet and the P and L. Um, so this is fascinating to me, but I might be accused of being a nerd at this point. Um, right, let's move on. Um, Laurie, come back to us if you've got more points. On that question of retroactive payments, we could cover any payments that were deferred previously, i.e. an executive director's salary that was reduced in January and February if we received a PPP loan in March. Wow. Um, I think you've got to look at the, your financial statements and you've got to sign them off. So you've got to look at what you're, what you're showing. And I think you've got to talk to a, a CPA and a tax preparer quite carefully here as to how you're going to show items of, of expenditure and then subsequently what you're going to use the PPP loan for that can be legitimately covered within the loan forgiveness period. Yeah, and then if you're... If, if the expenditures are dated prior to you receiving the loan, and then, then it would be no, you can't retroactively pay yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to push the salary, say you didn't have any funding, and then you need to pay yourself in March of when you receive, then that's, and again, go to your CPA to make sure that this is all <laughs> legitimate that you can do this mm -hmm. but just say the scenario is you're going to pay yourself in march that has to be march payroll you yep. can't say oh i'm paying myself for january and february in march because i got this loan now so yep. you cannot do in a retroactive payment no, it's a tricky one there's more flexibility when you're self-employed yeah than there is as a as the head of a business or an employee or the highest paid member of staff yeah yeah uh, there's contract law here. There's all sorts of different issues in uh, employment law. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> CPA. <laughs> CPA, yeah. A very competent one. A, competent. a good one. A yes. good one. Um, just to put SBDC on the spot, do you ever make referrals to CPAs for business owners or, or not? I, I'm not sure. I, I, do um, do? We do have some uh, within our organization that are uh, CPAs. Okay, fine. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm always interested in learning from CPAs and, and knowing who to refer to. Okay. And then we do also uh, have workshops with CPAs, uh, attorneys, things like that, that are free that we can uh, offer to clients and non-clients as well. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'm a sole proprietor. I don't have employees. I started my business in 2019. I filed my taxes for 19 at, in April 2020. I didn't pay any tax as I didn't have any profit. I'm planning to file my taxes for 2020 this year. Good. What shall I use to prove my annual income in 2020 compared increased to 2019? So effectively, if you haven't got this sort of quarter by quarter position, you're looking at the year as a whole then, presumably. Uh, well, you should have your P&Ls on a quarterly basis. Basis, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then they're exactly. going to look at your bank statements. So that's so how you're going to construct, construct it. You're going to use your bank statements to try to construct your P&L if you haven't had one. Yeah. 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 Got it. Thank you. So P&Ls, 
spreadsheet, talk to, take some advice, then submit. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, Laurie asks, no, it's fine. Questions are good. Uh, how much does applying, how much does applying for and accepting a PPP loan affect my ability to be approved for a regular SMB loan? Um, if, if SMB, I'm not quite sure what the acronym is, but let's take that as a small business loan. If that's, a, if that's a, an FDIC approved loan that, that a bank or a recognized financial institution would, would provide you with, then uh, it shouldn't have any effect. The whole point of a PPP loan is that it doesn't compromise your, your credit rating or your, your capacity to, to be able to secure or have loans commercially. They're not or, looking at debt ratio calculations or things like that that they yep. would normally do. Um, so if, if the lender is telling you that the PPP loan does affect your ability to be approved, you either need to challenge that. Actually, what lenders are, are saying is if you have the loan and you say it's forgivable until it's forgiven, um, it's still an obligation on your part and they treat it that way. Right. Um, from a debt service standpoint. That's a yeah, we suggest isn't it? that you, you should get it forgiven before you try to get another loan. Yeah. That's a really good point. But sometimes a business has to go for that loan before right. they can get it forgiven. The circumstances are such that they've got to find the liquidity and the cash flow to sustain the business. So it could be that indirectly the lender is taking that into consideration because they do see it as an outstanding debt. Yes. So I would say it's a matter of communication with the new lender. Whoever is yep. doing that new small business loan, yep. uh, you need to demonstrate and have that open communication with them to say, hey, here's where I'm at. And you yep. know where your debt service numbers are. You know, how far, how far off are you? You know, does it make sense yep. to pursue getting the forgiveness? And will that change the picture? And if it does, then you have, you know, tells you what to do. And it, it could be that you, you kind of want to get the loan forgiveness completed in an eight week, a shorter period, yeah. because you want to apply for a loan. And that's, that's, that's the more important component of the calculation. Or the PPP is a bigger loan amount than what you're applying for commercially. So you've got to again, have a, have a sort of think about your future trading prospects and your cash flow going forward as to how, how this plays out. Okay. I uh, hope that's helpful to you, Laurie. Um, Anonymous question. I'm a sole proprietor, no employees, capping out at the 20,833 20, loan amount for PPP. My lender who did my first PPP has informed me they do not want any small business loans for a second. Please recommend lenders who are interested in funding my second PPP. Um, that would feel like lender match to me would be a good place to go. And then some of the fintechs would be taking applications very uh, easily. Uh, SBDC recommending any particular online lenders or are you just looking at everything that's in the market at the moment? Um, well, SBA is emphasizing CDFIs. Yes, um, exactly. Rather than the big banks. So yes. we do promote the CDFIs. Yes. Um, but ultimately it's up to you. I've um, seen some, I've seen. Sorry, Anne. Um, uh, uh, and who would they feel comfortable working with? Um, so, you know, a lot of them are comfortable with their primary bank. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a matter of helping them manage that conversation with the banker, um, getting them comfortable and having a good conversation. Um, but um, flexible, you know. I think do your research quickly now over the next two to three days. Try and get um, clear in your mind by, say, Monday of next week, who you want to apply to would be my advice. Um, and use Lender Match just to do your sort of core research. And then just do a Google search. I was checking on things. The NFIB website has got a good list. Uh, small business majority, a number of the, the chambers of commerce, a number of the kind of business friendly organizations across the United States are addressing this question because many small businesses want to know who, it, who are the lenders are out there that are wanting to accept new customers and take on a second PPP loan. Okay. Um, I have a list uh, that I've put onto a PDF document of the 240 lenders that, have, that lent 
uh, made PPP loans to businesses physically located in the city of San Jose. So I have a PDF list. So if anyone wants a copy of that PDF list, it's public because it's shown on the, on the data that was down, that was made available by the SBA on the PPP loan program performance. So I have that. Uh, and those 240 financial institutions made over 13,000 loans last year under PPP to business in the city. So they're pretty well known in many cases. CDFIs, I think is a really good one to go for. Um, and again, I've got a list of the CDFIs if anyone would like that. But uh, I would say make your decision quickly in the next three to four days about who you're going to use. Uh, they are out there. Try lender match. Um, oh, we've got another one. Uh, W2 employee. Um, as a, in 2019, they were a software engineer. They did quite well. Laid off in 2019 and then started working as an independent contractor from March 2020 onwards. So my 1099 income in 2020 is a fraction, i.e. smaller than what I earned as a W-2 in the previous year, 2019. Am I eligible to apply for a PPP loan or any other financial assistance program? Oh, that's, so there's sort of two questions in one. Um, you can certainly apply for other forms of financial assistance, such as the California Relief Fund, which is a, in, effect, in effect a grant. Um, is the obvious one and that reopens on February the 2nd next week uh, and we're doing a, a webinar this Thursday to go over the relief grant um, but can you apply for a PPP loan I'm thinking about it. Anne Ali do you have a view on that one well the PPP loan would be calculated based on um, the payroll for I'm not sure. You see, that's a good question, isn't it? 1099. I was working as a W-2, but if he's an independent contractor, he wouldn't get a W-2. No, he, I think he must have been an employee. Yeah, he. they won't include any of your W-2 income into this. It so won't factor it into it. as a subcontractor. So I, I would incline to say no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, the anonymous person that's asked the question, I think our sense of this is probably no. Yeah, because if you only became an independent contractor in March 2020, then there's no comparison to uh, 2019. And you wouldn't need to have had been in business um, since, since February. February. Yeah. Couple of good questions here, Anonymous. Can you use the fund to hire additional replacement employees who had retired or left? Um, without knowing the circumstances, my answer is yes. The whole purpose of payroll protection program is to protect the payroll and bringing people back into work is in, a, in essence the, the spirit of what the program is designed to do. Yes, and if they refuse after do a formal offer letter because documentation is key again. And then if they say, no, we don't want to come back, you have to show proof that they did not want to come back so that you could offer it to a new uh, employee. employee if that's what you have to do, because you have to retain that uh, retention of employees. You have to show proof of that, whether it's a new employee or someone who's come back. So again, documentation. <laughs> In theory, the answer is yes, please yes. document. <laughs> and um, we like that. That's a good use of funds. That's, that's one that the Treasury and the SBA would be delighted to hear. Yeah. Ah, here's, here's a different one. Our taxes are on a fiscal year, July to June. So do I submit July 18 to June 19? Will that be okay to submit? Um, yes. Okay, the panel is nodding. I'll take that's a yes. <laughs> yes. That's the, that's the 2019. Yeah. yeah, because essentially what happens when people have financial years that are different from the, from the calendar yeah. year, the fiscal year is not the same as the calendar year. Correct. The figures are converted back into the calendar year, aren't they, when you submit your tax return? Because you're paying your 2019 taxes. Yes. It's kind of back, like, I don't want to say backwards, but you're a little bit behind. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's called adjusted. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, as someone who's not familiar with the nuance of US tax legislation, is it your advantage that you should always have your fiscal year 
at the end of January so that you get an 11 months grace. Never is, there, is there a kind of gain here for a business? No, okay, all right, I'm no. just thinking out loud. Okay. <laughs> Victor, you try to... Because <laughs> where I come from in the UK, you pay your taxes based on an April 1 to March 30th year, not the calendar year. It's always the fiscal year is your tax year. Ah. Uh, it's but, never the calendar year. Yeah. And then... <laughs> Even and, here in the US, um, you know, you have until um, April to get your taxes done. Yes. And you have course. until April to pay your taxes. Yes. <laughs> so you're paying it for the prior years. If that's not confusing, then I don't know what is. Well, yeah, I, I, we won't get into the nostalgia of UK versus USA. It's just, um, yeah, okay, uh, my apologies. Um, I'm getting distracted. I, I do apologize to everyone. Um, so um, I had a verbal pre-approved agreement to purchase a warehouse I rent, but now they're saying I fell out of qualification. Um, I'm not sure we can answer that the way that's written, Laurie. Um, so uh, I think she had asked earlier if she could also get an SBA loan. Got it. PPP. Okay. Oh, so that'd be like a 7A or a 504 because you want to acquire yeah. an asset. Got I think it. it would have been a 504. Yep. More than likely. Um, yeah. yeah, you can fall out of qualification because like Anne said earlier, that debt service, the bank, the lender is going to look at it. If they look at you as a higher risk because of uh, less income or uh, obviously you can't uh, run your business the way, at full capacity. Uh, yeah, but you know, if you do take the PPP and then things are starting to move forward, you may be eligible again. So I, I wouldn't completely count that out in the future, but probably right now they look at you as a higher risk. Do you think there's something there where, I mean, obviously we don't know the circumstances of the agreement between landlord and tenant, where in effect the tenant can come to a written agreement that's effectively a, an option with a date in it that allows the tenant here to be able to secure the PPP loan, then go back and secure an SBA loan? Or is that, am I, am I trying to be too clever here? Um, it kind of, it's a bit of negotiation, isn't it, between tenant and landlord here and then between tenant and lender? Actually, I think this is between- The lender. And the lender. The lender, yeah. Because, um, Obviously, they fell out of qualification for a reason. Yes. And um, a pre-approval is not a hard approval. Pre-approval is just looking at the basic numbers. When you come to the back-end approval, which is what seals your deal, um, you don't fall out of qualification, not unless you let the time expire. Your got documents it. got old or stale. Got it, yeah. You know, those lines. Uh, we had a compliment from Laurie, thank you. And then final question, how can we get registered to the webinar this Thursday on the California Relief Fund? Um, emails have, have gone out to all businesses, so please check your, your email uh, inbox. But I know that uh, the person that I, I rely on here to, to host the webinar for me, the, the, the technical side, will be sending out another email reminder to every business in the city if they want to attend um, the webinar this coming Thursday at 4 p.m. Same format as today where we try and give you a 20, 30 minute max overview, get you into the, the detail of the application process and then take a QA. and a um, I think we have answered every question. Um, um, oh, someone's put the website for California Relief Fund. Oh, that's the SBA, SBDC. That's you. They put up as the, as the <laughs> Anne and, and Ali. Um, I'd need to check on that uh, because you kind of, a lot of people have gone directly to Lendistry, haven't they, for the California Relief Fund? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it would be sbdc.lendistry.com, I believe. Okay. So I know it's an anonymous question, but please check that it's Lendistry because you often have to click when I was last looking at the Lendistry website, you yeah. have to click on the county that you're applying through and the Correct. partner. 
Yeah. So this is kind of the the landing page that they've yes. given for the relief grant, which has a lot of the criteria information. But in order to get to the application itself, you have to choose your county or the language. Got it. Yeah. Um, Anne and Ali, thank you very much indeed for giving up your time. And, and I deeply appreciate that you've answered every question that's come into the chat box over the course of the last, uh, last hour. That's been fantastic. Thank you all for participating in this webinar. At the end, I'm just going to say, here are the links that will be coming out. Uh, here is my name and who I am, where I work, and this is my email address. So if any of the participants wish to send me a follow-up email, um, I am generally saying to businesses, please take advice. If you haven't got, if you haven't got a, an SP, a CPA or a tax preparer that you trust or work with, uh, please, please seek out free technical advice of which I do recommend the Small Business Development Centre with Ali and Anne providing a fantastic service at no charge to you, the business owner here in San Jose. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you very much indeed for taking the time out to listen to into the webinar. Thank you for the questions. We tried to go through them uh, individually. Um, and as I say, if there's any follow-up, please, please take the opportunity to follow up with me. Uh, and last but not least, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Ali. You're Goodbye. welcome. Thank you, Good everybody. Night. A pleasure.